Yes. Good morning, brothers and sisters. As we begin again in our study of Judges chapter 10 and Ezekiel chapter 8, as we are comparing line upon line, shall we seek our Heavenly Father's guidance so that we may more correctly divide the word of truth for this time? Shall we ask his guidance and his blessing? <clears throat> Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for the examples that you have provided within your word of truth. We thank you, Father, for this opportunity we have to come together and to study. We thank you that we may have our minds opened so that as they are opened and as we continue to walk in the path that was placed before us, that we may see the light for our feet for the path before us, ahead of us. Be with us now. Help us so that that which we learn, we may be able to correctly apply, that we may be guided by you so that we may more perfectly show to others this that you would have us to understand for this time in earth's history. Direct us to this end. May your angels attend us. May your spirit be with us. For this we ask and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Now, before us, we have the verse that, that we were leaving off on yesterday, and we will go forward to finish this brief study in Ezekiel so that we can then return to the book of Judges. And he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house, and behold, at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar were about five and twenty men with their backs toward the temple of the Lord and their faces toward the east, and they worshiped the sun toward the east. Now, a comment that I made yesterday was partially refuted by one in the chats. Because my application about these five and 20 men was if we apply this to the corporate church, that this would likely be the president of the general conference and his vice presidents. Now, thanks to research from Stephen, we will, we will share this following, and we're going to have this placed in the record. That about five and 20 men, the 1901 General Conference Bulletin states the executive committee of this conference shall be 25 in number. As she goes forward, Ellen White wrote, yet we hear that the voice of the conference is the voice of God. How often do we hear this today? How often are we being told that the pronouncements from Elder Wilson and from the general conference are as the voice of God? But at that time, she continued. Every time I've heard this, I have thought that it was almost what? Blasphemy. The voice of the conference ought to be the voice of God, but it is not. 
because some in connection with it are not men of faith and prayer. They are not men of elevated principle. There is not a seeking of God with the whole heart. There is not a realization of the terrible responsibility that rests upon those in this institution to mold and fashion minds after the divine similitude. <clears throat> in more recent times, the following letter was dispatched. Here at the General Conference, the highest decision-making committee, of course, is the General Conference Committee. There is a committee that we term General Conference Officers, which is made up of about 25 or 26 individuals, presidents, secretaries, treasurers, with a few other invited individuals. This committee is a screening committee that determines the items that need to go to the general conference committee. Now, you may find these in the 1901 General Conference Bulletin, page 379, article four, section one, column one, paragraph two. The second, manuscript 37 of 1901, the third is a letter from the office of the president of the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventist, B.E. Jacobs, administrative assistant to the president, November 1, 1990. <clears throat> Let these words carefully weigh upon your minds. For a moment, please consider that we are seeing again that what was shown in the past is occurring in our present. Is there any question or comment upon what has just been read? Okay, um, well, first question is, what were you talking about something partially refuted? What did you mean by that? What are you talking well, about? Yesterday in the chat, a comment was made that the president of the general conference only had six or seven vice presidents. So the attempt was made to say that the application here was incorrect. Okay. Well, I said it was an attempt to partially refute. Okay. Okay. So I'm, I'm not aware of that. I didn't see that, I guess, in the chat or didn't notice it. Um, but yeah, so we would say that this uh, 25 men represents... Uh, the General Conference Executive Committee. That's what it's called in the 1901 General Conference Bulletin. Right. <clears throat> but in the, in the 1990 letter, they're calling it the General Conference Committee. Um, uh, well, they have the General Conference Committee and they have the General Conference Officers. Okay. So, because... Uh, it says here at the General Conference, the highest decision-making committee, of course, is the General Conference Committee. And it says there's a committee that we term the General Conference Officers, which is made up of about 25 or 26 individuals. Okay. Um, and this committee is a screening committee that determines the items that need to go to the General Conference Committee. But here they don't say how many people are in the General Conference Committee. Got it. You're right. 25 or not. Um, so I don't know if they still use that number. I just don't know. Um, so, but yeah, I think we've uh, always understood that the 25 referred to the general conference committee that was decided in 1901, that it's going to be 25 in number. Right. If that has continued. I don't know. 
<clears throat> okay. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. So we know that Jeff made this a long time ago, this application. Right. Now, we're using it here in um, because we're making an application to our time. But we, we make the application, in a sense, by making the parallel with, with, with Adventist history. So that's the idea here of these four. <laughs> recognize their fulfillment in Adventist history, uh, but we see that they represent um, a progression within our movement itself. So now I, I, I have an odd question just for consideration. There have been many that have chosen to, in a manner of speaking, turn their back upon the light that Elder Jeff had been giving and that we have been accepting. Is it possible when we take a look at this with Jamal, Dario, Emiliano, Mark Bruce, and many of these others that have chosen to abandon this light that we would also find 25? Well, I don't know. I mean, it'd be hard to say how to exactly count that. Right. Uh, but I think symbolically as a number, um, we would have to say that it's that those that reject it become part of that symbolic number of 25. Right. Now, now, 25 itself, well, with that little study that Stephen had given us regarding the uh, Acts chapter 27 with the fathoms and comparing it with Ezekiel 45, 12. It was excellent. Yeah, so so the idea there just, uh, is that was before we started recording, uh, but the idea there is that these fathoms are 72 inches and we have two different numbers uh, that are represented there. Uh, that when added together become uh, 2520. So there's 1,080 and um, uh, what's the other number? I just don't uh, point. 1440. Oh, right. Yeah, 1440. So 1440, which is um, 20, 20 fathoms and 1,080 inches in 15 fathoms. And um, if you take in Ezekiel 45, 12, it, it divides the manna into uh, 15, 25, and, and 20. And so if we took the 25, you might probably better have Stephen explain it, but me just trying to work it out maybe is a good idea. So if we take the 25 and we multiply it, times 72, we get 1800. Now 1800 gives us this July 18, 2020 date. And the difference between um, 1800 um, and uh, the 1440 is 360. And the difference between the 1800 and the 1008 is 72. So you have the, the symbol for the prophetic symbol of a year, plus you have 720, I said 72, 720. So you have 18, seven and 20. So you have the 18 symbol for July 18 and the seven and 20 symbolizing the seventh month and the 20th year. So you have the symbol. But anyway, if we look here at these 25 men then, um, this is a symbol of, 1800 if we multiplied it by 72 right and and this 1800 in and of itself um if we were going to go to uh because we're studying right now uh judges uh chapter 10 and um looking at this where it talks about these 18 years, right? So that's that's why we've been looking at this in Ezekiel in the first place, correct? Correct. 
And so these 18 years, which we're going to count um, from, uh, well, we, we counted it from September 11th, 2001 to, um, uh, to, to 2019, right? That's one way we did it. And the other way we did it, we counted from the Mayan calendar date, December 21st, 2012, um, to uh, January 1st, 2031, ending that year, 2030. So we had two different ways in which we could apply these 18 years. And then we had to decide, uh, are we going to use both of them? Or are we going to just use the one? Mm -hmm. I made an argument for the one for 2012. Uh, based upon the rise of Parminder's teaching. And so what we're, we're trying to do here is we're trying to take these four abominations of Ezekiel and we're placing them, as far as this movement is concerned, from 2012 onward of these, these abominations. Is that correct, what I'm saying, how we've at least been trying to apply it? Is there something I'm missing? I think you've given a uh, a good sketch of this. Okay. Now, I, I think probably both are correct. I think we could probably take both of these eighteen years, but they would have to apply to different to a different situation. Um, So, so that is, we can make two applications of the 18 years and two applications of the four abominations within that time frame, within our history of our movement. I don't know if that seems reasonable to people or not. Why wouldn't it be reasonable? Yeah, well, that's what I'm asking. <laughs> is is there some way in which it, you know, one or the other should be applied only, or that even the application it's wrong it itself is wrong? You know, as as we're looking at this, I was I was looking at a, a point, a little separate from what what you're just going over, because. When you're looking at these fathoms, and we're looking at 1,080 plus 1,440. Yeah. Your 1,080 is your 18 with just a zero in between the two digits. Yeah. But your 1,440 is another symbol for the 144,000. Yep. So I think your, your application, as we're addressing this right now, regarding this for the 18 years is correct. Okay, well, if, if we're applying 18 years, let's say from 2001 to 2019, that would be a specific, um, and remember that we had already done uh, some work with that um, in connection with um, uh, and the different light, because we were looking at like the 20 months and different different other symbols, 20 months for 20 years. And, uh, I'm not going to go into all that, but um, the way that I would look at it then is that we have from 2001, we have this specific part of our message that ends up being rejected. That is the first angel's message um, within this movement. So we know the first angel's message is rejected at 9-11 for the church, right? Correct. But for this movement, that's going to be November 9th, 2019. Okay, I, yeah, I see this. Because we mark that as the first disappointment. And, but then we have an 18 years that we would then apply for within this movement 
to the second angel's message. And now the second angel's message, of course, uh, we would look at as July 18, 2020, um, that that would have been, uh, uh, you know, what we call the midnight cry. So, so November 9th, 2019 has these different purposes, depending which line you're in, what group of people you're talking about. But um, when it comes to this movement, we're still uh, in this period of time in which we're examining the second angel's message. Because remember, we look at July 18th as Samuel Snow's uh, uh, last letter, which is three days before midnight. And so we're not even to midnight yet. Yet, well, you know, we, we might argue, that, depending on what line we're in, but it, definitely on the line of the Levites, we're not. But within this movement itself, there is an evaluation being made of that message, which we would call the second angel's message. That is, it, Jeff isn't being a part of it, just as, in a sense, he is, just like Miller was a part of October 22nd, 1844. Um, but as we move through this, we're, we're now no longer with FFA, but we're still evaluating the previous history and we're making a decision. And that's what this movement is, is experiencing. We're, we're experiencing that um, midnight, midnight cry, that history of the second angel's message, the seventh month movement, internally, right? And um, maybe we could take the 18 years there as beginning in 2012 when we first have this time setting introduced because the second angel's message is more closely related to this evaluation of time that would end then at the end of 2030, at least symbolically, right? Correct. Um, <clears throat> So we could we can make you know different applications of these four abominations. I mean, we can make an application uh, to the church itself. We can make a further application from the message from 2001 till 2019, and now we can make an application from 2012, uh, which is much more closely connected to July 18th, where the first one is more closely connected with. November 9th, because that's where it culminates. And uh, to me, this makes a lot of sense. Um, whether it makes as much sense to everyone else, I don't know. I think you've established a prima facie case. Okay. Because at, at this point, we have these symbols of these 18 years. Mm -hmm. Now, <clears throat> the four abominations, as we have, as, as we've been establishing in our study of the book of Judges, we are looking at this within the movement, but we're also having to look that these examples that are impacting the movement would also impact us as individuals. Mm -hmm. Now, just another thing going back to Ezekiel 45.10. Sure. Uh, well, because um, we are looking at Ezekiel 45.12. But it says, ye shall have just balances in verse 10, and a just ephah, and a just bath. So the way that we applied this when we looked at Ezekiel 45, when we were studying the book of Ezekiel, is that this has to do with prophecy, that these measurements are prophetic measurements, and they have to be just. Right? Correct. And, and, and just there, that's the word tzedek, which means uh, uh, right, right natural, moral, or legal, 
um, also uh, justice, right? So that's why it's translated as just. And you have these balances. So you're going to have three that are mentioned. So balances are motzen, which is a pair of scales, and then a just ifa. And this ifa is um, usually used in measuring grain, and a bath is used for measuring liquids. Um, <coughs> So why would we have these three mentioned? Why the balances? Why the grain, which would be weight, um, and then bath being volume? How would that relate to time prophecy? Because then we're going to have money mentioned as well, right? Uh, that's going to be the shekel. <clears throat> And we already, in Ezekiel, they'd been measuring the temple, and we saw that linear measurements also represented time. So is, is this an indication that we can take all of these symbols, these different types of measurements, and, and, and that they represent time prophecies? On the surface, I would have to think that that's correct. Yeah. And, and we also know, like from Daniel chapter 5, we used uh, the Mini Mini Tikal Upharsan uh, to represent uh, the 2520 as well as the 126 years and the 151 years. Um, depending whether we have a mana of 50 shekels or 60 shekels. Now, here in Ezekiel 45, 12, then, when they divide the shekel or, or divide the mana into um, uh, this, this 20, 25, and 15, which just seems odd that they would do it that. They don't just say uh, your mana, you know, 60 shekels shall be your mana. You know, they say the shekels shall be 20 geras, but then they say, you know, 20 shekels, 5 and 20 shekels, and 15 shekels shall be your mana. And, and so they divide it into these three different measurements. And as Stephen pointed out, we can represent then, based upon comparison with Acts 27, that this represents July 18, 2020. So, and the one thing we have here is these 25 shekels, which we're now relating to these 25 elders, and also in chapter 11, the 25 princes. Well, <clears throat> the pronouncement from Scripture, once we, once we have compared this with what Mrs. White had written, and what we know is currently occurring, the pronouncement from scripture is fearful because if we look at this in the same vision in Ezekiel 11, we covered Ezekiel 11 verse one yesterday. Yeah. Moreover, the spirit lifted me up and brought me unto the east gate of the Lord's house, which looketh eastward and beheld the door of the gate five and twenty men, among whom I saw Jazaniah the son of Asia, and Pelatiah the son of Beniah, princes of the people. Then said he unto me, son of man, these are the men that devise mischief and give wicked counsel in the city. So the pronouncement that is going here on these 25 <clears throat> is not very positive. Yeah. But if we multiplied it by the 72, right, we would get the 1800. Yep. Which would apply to uh so maybe we could look at um this the the elders. So you have the four, the 5 and 20 elders in chapter 8. Right. And we can 
this is just me thinking on the top of my head, but maybe that that 1800, multiplying it by 72, um, represents the 18 years from uh, 2001 to 2019. But here, the princes are representing from 2012 to 2030. All right. Um, I don't know if people are following my thinking because I'm sort of, uh, but if, if we look at this movement, and, and maybe there's other ways we could apply it as well, but when we look at this movement, we can see that there's these two different divisions of the movement, the period up to 2019, which marks the end of something, and, and it appears that we have this period now um, that's connected with July 18th that begins in 2012. Um, that's going to go to 2030 and that this is the princes of the people um, but in a sense they're doing what had happened before it's part of that continued um, apostasy but here it's represented by these princes and the characteristic that they have is that they are safe because they're in Jerusalem and that these other people who have been cast out, um, they're, they're of no, no account, right? That is, in this case, it would be northern Israel. And so, so they're in Jerusalem. They're safe. You can't, the judgments that came upon Samaria and all those other places won't apply to us because we're in Jerusalem. And, and this would demonstrate the type of um, thinking that exists in the movement presently that is looking down upon others um, and, and feeling that they're safe. But is this, th this is a feeling that they are safe. It is not a statement that they are safe. Right. And of course, we know that the answer to this in Ezekiel 11 is this um, new heart. Right. And the new spirit, um, which is the third angel's message, certainly. Exactly. And, and yet... <laughs> You know, so we so we have this problem. I mean, it's, it's very, very um, uh, compelling, I guess, when we, when we look at this whole picture, uh, because it's describing what we've already seen other places. Now, you know, there could be a subjective part to that, but, um, you know, we have some objective things that we looked at. So the 25 representing the 18 which represents the 18 years that we're looking at in Judges. Um, you know, we didn't, we didn't start with these, these ideas. We just started with looking at these 18 years in Judges 10. But they seem to fit, and in two different spans of 18 years. In... In keeping with some of this, though, Ezekiel 11.2 could easily be compared with both Esther 8, verse 3, and Jeremiah 5, verse 5. In, in this situation, these 25 men that devise mischief and giveth wicked counsel. When we look at this in Esther 8, verse 3, we are told that Esther spake again before the king and fell down at his feet and besought him with tears to put away the mischief of Haman the Agagite and his device that he had devised against the Jews. Mm hmm which is the Sunday law. Correct. Now in Jeremiah 5.5, 5, 
I will get me unto the great men, and I will speak unto them, for they have known the way of the Lord and the judgment of their God, but these have altogether broken the yoke and burst the bonds. Now, in Esther, are these 25 being compared then with those that would choose destruction rather than life? They're being compared with Haman. And then here in, in Jeremiah, are we also not given a warning? I mean, I wouldn't want to be among those 25. I wouldn't want to have that symbol applied to me. I mean, I recognize that this is a, a bit further than what we had originally looked at, but I mean, these symbols are taking front and center of our current attention so that we may more properly understand how important Ezekiel 8 and Judges 10 are for us today. Mm. Yeah, and it's, yeah, well, definitely we have to apply it to us, to this movement. Now, just, just going back to this 18 years from uh, September 11th, 2001. So, Remember, if I counted in prophetic years, that is years of 360 days, um, that would bring me to June 9th, 2019, exactly one year after Jeff's prayer, where he closes the Sabbath um, at 9-11, and it's, it's a, a year and a week since the first uh, closing of the Sabbath, or opening of the Sabbath at 9-11, and the ending of... Uh, the uh, Pentecost, right? So in 2017, he had a 9-11 prayer on June 2nd, which was closing Pentecost, opening the Sabbath. And then in 2018, he had this 9-11 um, prayer, um, closing the Sabbath. And, and that's going to begin that period between the 9th and the 10th, where we're going to have time setting. So time setting is going to be introduced that day you know so he closes the sabbath and the next day the first day of the week sunday parminder is going to do his presentation on june 10th on time setting and so we're ending this 18 years with time setting um but we use 2012 and 2012 is going to be marking um the time setting that parminder began right and that's going to symbolically be uh, connected with 2030 in these 18 years. Now, of course, we're using December 31st or December 21st, um, 2012. I mean, we could even probably have counted because uh, we don't know exactly when he presented his um, time setting. We don't have the exact date. We know by June 30th it was being discussed um, on Facebook and that the School of the Prophets had, and Jeff, FFA, had already addressed it. They, they, so it wasn't School of the Prophets because they didn't have it yet, but Jeff had already addressed this uh, as fanaticism. So, I mean, that could bring us to 2030, even to, you know, April 5th, 2030, if we knew the exact date. But, but the point is, we have these two periods of, of 18 years. And... Um, the symbols attached to them all tie us to uh, to this movement regarding time setting. Um, and one is, uh, you know, Parminder, of course, introduced a false time setting. 
right? At the end of that 18 years in 2019, even though we come to Parminder again presenting, it's going to lead to a type of time setting that is based upon correct principles. Even though Parminder has these false principles, um, it's going to lead to uh, an understanding of time that is correct. And that's what we're presently dealing with. That is, we can't predict events, but we can see time symbolically. And right now we're dealing with, in this movement, a, a conflict over of how we deal with these elements. You know, can we predict, you know, Trump being reelected, um, becoming president again? Can we predict events in the future? Or can we just measure the time and and see that once those things have passed, that it was the time, not to what we expected, but but showing the way marks leading and guiding us along the way. Um, I mean, that's the, the whole issue of the way marks in Adventism, the watching and the waiting. You know, we pass over fulfilled prophecy, the light reflects back upon the past, past events, and those past events uh, shine light forward for our feet. And yet people want to see beyond their feet. And, and we're never given a promise that we can see beyond our feet. Very true. Okay, can you bring up your notes again? Um, okay. Now, I, I guess one other loose thread I need to deal with, and that has to do with the women weeping for Tamas. Right. So, um, you know, I did quite a bit of reading on it, and, I mean, there's so much opinion. Pretty much the, the thing that everybody's agreed upon is we don't really know much about it. The, the one thing I want to point out, though, is that um, – when you look at the reasoning behind some of these ideas about Tammuz and his connection to these various gods, a lot of this has to do with the idea of the evolution of religion. That is, um, they don't see um, uh, many of these scholars and so forth, that there is a true religion. They just see all of these religions as sort of a development that happens. And, and, and they would take even the god Yahweh. He's just some development of some sort of pagan god, right? Um, you know, Elohim uh, being the same as, you know, some kind of moon god or something like that. All these different things that they have. So, so these gods sort of develop and, and that they're all borrowed, Right. So, I mean, and we do know that that's the case, that in a sense, uh, you know, the Egyptians borrowed gods from other religions, uh, the, the Romans, the Greeks, um, and they wove their own stories about these gods. So there isn't some consistent story, you know, when you try to compare Tammuz for, with Adonis. Um, uh, you know, you, you can't take later developments that happened in Greek and Roman history and sort of uh, place them upon what was happening here in Ezekiel chapter 8. Uh, the only thing that we can see is that that Tammuz, um, in the stories of the Babylonian uh, Middle Eastern thought at this time, is that he spends half the time in the underworld and half the time in heaven, right? So there's this divided... Um, uh, his time is divided. And, and of course, you know, Stephen, when he talks about, Stephen was talking about uh, how this is connected sort of with the summer, that, you know, everything's dried up. And, and it seems that that's probably uh, the most that we can say about it is that the women weeping for Tammuz are worshiping a Babylonian god. And, and this has to do with the harvest. So it seems that Tammuz is connected with shepherds and with grain and and so basically he's an agricultural god um 
and and that weeping for Tammuz means that they've turned their back upon upon Jehovah, right? Agreed. Yeah. So how much we can say beyond that, I don't know. But um, as far as weeping for Tammuz, uh, you know, this is going to be connected with the summer solstice and various opinions, but most of them, it's either six days or seven days that this weeping goes on. So I don't know which is correct, but, and it probably it could have changed at different times, but it's, it's uh, in the month of Tammuz is when the walls of Jerusalem are going to be breached on the ninth day of Tammuz, right, in, in uh, the book of Ezekiel. Uh, well, not so much in Ezekiel because he doesn't deal with uh, uh, the end of the siege, but he deals with the beginning. But in that period of the time of Ezekiel. And so if we're going to try to find some parallel to the women weeping for Tammuz, would it be somehow connected with the rejection of some kind of understanding of prophecy? You know, look, just in general sense, they're gone into paganism. But could we attach it to some specific understanding that this movement has had regarding prophecy? I think that would have to be considered, but we'd have to we'd have to kind of line that out to see how we would do it. Okay, so. So we had um, uh, the image of jealousy beginning in 2012. Right. And then we had the secret chambers, the chamber, every man in the chambers of his imagery. And how did we apply that? Where, where did we place that? If I was putting it on a line, I'd have to think that we, we would have placed it somewhere about 2014. Right. Yeah. So we'd placed that at 2014. So now we have women weeping for Tamas. And, and so we'd have to look at this progressively. And um, so would the women weeping for Tammuz, uh be a rejection of the message? And would we... Would we then equate that with July 18th? Well, I don't. I don't know if I'd put it to July 18th because I'm going to deal with that. July 18th to me would be the the, the five and twenty elders. Okay. Um, but prior to that uh, was uh, the message of Ezekiel itself in 2017. Okay. Right. So in 2017. Uh, we had this message, which was related to July 18th, in the sense that we were looking at Ezekiel, or not Ezekiel, but Samuel Snow's letters and their relationship to the book of Ezekiel, and also to the book of Ezra. It was all this light that this movement received in 2017. Right. Now, it took Jeff a year to actually appreciate it. It wasn't until 2018 that he understood Samuel Snow's letters and began presenting it. Um, so, but in 2017, uh, the movement rejected this message of Ezekiel and, and the symbol that we have, um, if we're going to, to deal with 2017, I mean, it's going to be the symbol of midnight because that's going to be what Samuel Snow's letters are about the three days before midnight. And that's in the month of Tammuz, Right. The fifth day of the fourth month. So, so the the fact that we're brought to the month of Tammuz, and instead of seeing the light of of the message of the the seventh month movement, the light that's going to lead to the midnight midnight cry, etc., these people are weeping. That is, they're they're not accepting the true light because this is a false message, and. And we have these women with, you know, this prediction before midnight and all these different things. The other thing that happens in 2017 is the revival of 
Harminder's initial uh, time prophecy that he made in 2012, right? Because in 2017, now they're going to start accepting, um, and Aram puts it as false light of rain, but they're going to start accepting that Parminder was correct in his assessment of 2014, right? Which is going to lead to then the time setting that happens in 2018. But um, so I'm just suggesting that maybe this month of Tammuz is pointing to that month where the fifth day of the fourth month occurs. Now, you know, we know that it's it's going to be in the month of Tammuz, and it's six or seven days that the women weep for Tammuz. So it would actually at least be during that time of the fifth day of the fourth month. And right. that's where Ezekiel begins his prophesying, is on the fifth day of the fourth month. So his first vision is on the fifth day of the fourth month. Now his second vision is on the um, the fifth day of the sixth month, um, you know, a year later. But um, uh, I don't know what, whether people think that that's logical or not. I mean, you usually agree with me, but um, I, I, if we're going to place it, it would have to be 2017. So then if we're going to take the fourth one, the abomination, it would be the, re the rejection of July 18. And that's going to happen in 2019. 2020 and onward. But 2019, there's a rejection of July 18th by the vast majority of the movement, right? Jeff is going to hold on to July 18th and then proclaim it, but the movement rejects it. And, and we're still in that time, in a sense, of that rejection of July 18th. That's what this movement is really about right now is do we understand what led us to the July 18, 2020 prediction? And are we going to take the lessons that God had taught us in that making that prediction and make the proper applications as we move forward in understanding where this movement is going and the role and responsibility that we have as a movement? And are we going to accomplish that responsibility? Are we going to fulfill that role? That is a deep question. But in this situation, the, the general application that you're making is I, I think it, it, it holds up and holds up well. So our question today in this with the, with the 25 men, but the five and 20 men with their backs toward the temple and their faces toward the east and they worship the sun toward the east, in rejecting July 18th, it means that there's a rejection being made, not only of Miller's rules, but of everything else in line upon line. Because then we're given this warning in Ezekiel 8.17. Yeah. Yeah, and, yeah, and sorry, um, just so one other point that, that I, I mentioned last time, but last yesterday, but I just want to emphasize it again, because I maybe wasn't as clear. But remember, this prophecy starts on the sixth year, the sixth month, and the fifth day of the month. Right. And it's going to culminate on the sixth year, the sixth month, the sixth day of the month. Six, six, six. Right. <clears throat> but remember how I'd done this measurement from 2001, and I ended up... Uh, because we have uh, June 9th, 2018. Right. But that brings me to June 9th, 2019. But notice there's one year difference. And Correct. a day is a year in Bible prophecy. Right. So this is bringing us through that history from 2018 when 
that time setting comes again into the movement and then to that rejection that's going to happen in uh, 2019. Now, it just gives us the symbolic date of June 9th. Nothing that I know in particular happens on June 9th that marks that. Maybe there is within the movement. Uh, but that's going to be, um, you know, a couple of months later that we actually see it manifest in what happens on uh, August 29th. Um, so, but, but that just everything fits so well. You know, once, once we look at it all, we look at the whole picture, it, it all fits together. But, but we now are addressing the, with Ezekiel 11, the 25 princes. Right. And that definitely would refer to this second period of 18 years. So that 25 elders is going to end in 2019. But now we're dealing with the 25 men who are princes. But it's also interesting as, as you're pointing this out, okay. there is an overlap in this situation, which symbolically is the seven times. Right. It's yeah, yeah it's the seven years from 2012 uh, to 20, uh, 2019. Yeah. And yeah, so that. It's kind of similar to what we get in Ezekiel 45, 12, where we have the 25, 20 uh, being symbolized in connection with Acts 27, but also July 18, 2020 uh, symbolized. Right. So as we're looking at this, in Ezekiel 8, 17. Oh, and just one other point, too. Yes, go ahead. So with Ezekiel 8, um, you know, we have the woman weeping for Tammuz, and then you have the, the, the man. You, you noted before it was north and east. Right. And north deals with the message of Babylon and east with the message of Islam. Correct. And, and this was specifically noted in 2018 and 19 when we – had Tess presenting this message, which we called uh, the message of the North. And, and I was presenting July 18th, the message of the East. Right, dealing with Islam. So Ezekiel 8.17, mm -hmm. if we reverse the numbers, we again come to 7.18. Mm -hmm. So symbolically, we are again dealing with July 18th. Those that come to this, then he said unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? It is a light thing to the house of Judah that they commit the abominations which they commit here. For they have filled the land with violence and have returned to pro provoke me to anger. And lo, they put branch to their nose. Now the alternate reading again, would bring us, is there anything lighter than to commit the abominations than they commit here? It's almost like this is being sarcastically offered. It's also another representation. If you choose to break one commandment, you have broken them all. Mm -hmm. For they have filled the land with violence, and they have returned to provoke me to anger. 
we cannot come before God and choose to provoke him. We cannot make this in a manner of our own devising. Amen. And lo, they have put the branch to their nose. We need to consider this carefully. Because is this not giving us another representation of the abomination of Molech? I mean, the reason they would put the branch to the nose, they would use a branch so they would not smell the burning flesh. We have a problem right now within the movement because if we're putting the symbolically placing the branch to the nose, the message that's going out is not a message of purity, it's a message of idolatry. And that's what's been happening so much within the corporate church. I was looking yesterday on Facebook because there are friends of mine that are still buying into the, the comments that have been being made by the corporate church that Ellen White, while she is a prophet, she's not on a level with the Bible. Yeah, well, I was just uh, having a, the discussion on academia with um, uh, Florin, uh, the guy's name's Florin, um, well, his last name is uh, L-A-I-U, so however you pronounce his last name. Um, He's a Romanian okay. uh, that teaches at Aventus University. Um, he's part of the fac faculty and he teaches pastoral theology. Um, but he says here, um, uh, where is it here? Um, I, I said to him, the Bible and the spirit of prophecy are not full of errors that need to be corrected by men's minds. And because he rejects uh, August 11th, 1840, plus uh, the start of the 2300 days, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and here's what he says, which I find rather odd. But he says, I did not ever say the Bible and spirit of prophecy are full of errors. We should always distinguish between the divine message and the human language with all its cultural cargo of limitations and imperfections and discrepancies. Only the divine message is inspired and perfect. So what, what he does is he takes from the Bible and the spirit of prophecy what he discerns as the divine message. I mean, this is so much like my dad uh, growing up as a kid that, you know, uh, the Bible says, shall we continue to sin that grace may abound, God forbid. Um, right. So he says, we're no longer under the law, but under grace. Right. And I then quote the next part of the verse, that part. And he says, well, the first part is inspired, but the second is only Paul's opinion. Right. So Paul has the opinion. Uh, but yet at the same time, he can give the word of God. Uh, but it's up to my dad to decide which is inspired and which isn't. And that's what this man is doing. And that's what was happening in that period um, between 1888 in 1919 and and then he goes on to say anything else in the bible or the spirit of prophecy is not inspired even though it is usually correct so he says there's this divine message which is inspired and perfect and then there's stuff in the spirit of prophecy which usually is correct but not inspired and occasionally it may contain some technical errors in its secondary information so this would be things like you know jesus was um crucified in 31 AD. That would be a technical error, right? And then he says, this is related to evidence, not just to the an ideal belief. It is not wise to make your faith dependent on the concept of Bible inerrancy, which is not a biblical concept. 
Not everything that was written in the Bible is God's message. And he says, example, the Ark of the Covenant surely did not contain the pot of manna or the rod of Aaron. And certainly the earth is not built on a sea. So, of course, he's taking some language which is from Psalm 24 and Deuteronomy 5.8, which is um, poetic language, um, which, of course, we wouldn't take literally. But anyway, um, you see the problem. I, I mean, I think it's pretty bold and clear that man now becomes the interpreter of God's word and this is exactly what Parminder was teaching in his methodology but correct agreed but is this also not the same fallacy that came when um The president of the General Conference prior to 1888 published his articles that there are portions of scripture that are inspired and portions that are not. Yeah, G.I. Butler. Yeah. Yeah. So, so mm -hmm. this on. is just another wind of doctrine that has been blowing since before 1888. Yeah. Now, so we saw it manifested, manifested though, in Parminder and why yes. he went. So far off track because he started to believe in his his own intellect to interpret scripture that right. that is methodology that if you have the right methodology and you had good teachers and uh, then you would come to the same conclusion I have have come to and that's not a Christian no position at all that that yep. right there is idolatry in a very pu pure form yeah. yeah so you know i'm i've been trying to make the case that this is still infecting the movement yes in connection with the trump prediction absolutely and again you're making your prima facie case yeah and now but some people may not see it right they may say well how is it different? And, and the simple thing is, um, we accept what Jeff taught, and we accept the methods in which he came to his conclusion, and we also accept the lessons that we learned from the failure of the prediction. And if we try to argue, and I've said this before, but if we try to argue that Trump has to become president again, it's, it's parallel to somebody resetting a date uh, for the second coming in Millerite history. Because either Trump's prediction was fulfilled, as Jeff said it was, in connection with that history, or it wasn't. And if it wasn't, we can't hold on to that prediction. Because they're basically saying the prediction was wrong. And that we're going to make it right by Trump becoming president again. But you can't have it both ways. Right. You, you, yeah, you can't have it both ways. You can't be, you can't just put it off into the future to be correct. Okay, so let me, uh, in, in, cutting, in cutting this through, the prediction of Trump becoming president again is something that is being very openly promoted by almost half of the United States right now. Yeah. It's, it's being very openly promoted by many in Australia and in many other parts of the world. But yeah, even, even many Democrats are, are really worried that it's going to happen. So I would say probably more than half of the population in the United States thinks it's a possibility. Okay, but how many of these are choosing mm -hmm. to study prophetics for the, the, the prophecies that we find within scripture and make these applications. They're not. So when we're when we come back to this and we have part of the movement that is trying to say <clears throat> that Trump being reelected is prophetic, are they not then joining 
with the the idolaters that we're going to find in the world they're making this more of man than they are of god mm -hmm. yeah well there, there's no doubt about that i mean and it's easy right now with what happened at the Mal malar 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 Mar a Lago estate. Mar a Lago estate. That, um, you know, people see, well, this is, you know, Trump's won this one. Um, and and it's pretty, you know, running in so, you know, but we know that that's just looking at things from the perspective of the world, not based upon God's word. You know, I, I found it interesting yesterday that the news media would come out decrying as false information that Trump's passports had been picked up by the FBI. Yeah. And then one specific broadcaster, Nora O'Donnell, mm -hmm. would make it very clear that, you know, this is just complete false information. And then later, after saying that the Justice Department had told her that this was not correct, she had to admit that she had one witness, where in journalism, just as we see within scripture, it is according to the testimony of two or three shall a thing be established. Mm -hmm. She chose to go off the word of one mm -hmm. and was shown to be that, that her statement and her pronouncement was completely false. Yeah. And, and, and actually, the, even the expression of two or three witnesses is really a Hebrew idiom. It's, it's not to be taken literally. That is, what it actually means is that everything has to be looked at. But as, as we would look at this within Scripture. Yeah. Especially with the examples that we are given. Mm -hmm. We need to have two or three witnesses as to what's going on right and, and none of those witnesses will contradict the entire testimony of god's word so in that correct sense, it is yeah. literal is it not no it, it, it means that you look at everything oh. right so we have to look as Mil one of miller's rules is that you look at all of the verses that apply all of the evidence you don't draw a conclusion from uh, a couple of uh, statements here or there, and you don't pick and choose. Well, our situation well, here yeah. with our with these five and twenty men, we have the five and twenty men that we are shown here in Ezekiel, in Ezekiel eight, and then in Ezekiel eleven one again we have the five and twenty men, but we have a differentiation between those five and twenty men. The first one, we have the man whose name means Yah has said or Yah has stated. Now we have Yah has stated in Ezekiel 11.1. 1. But as we're looking at this portion in Ezekiel 8, we have this reference that's being given. Have we seen this, O son of man? Is it a light thing to the house of Judah that they commit the abominations that they have committed here? Is it a light thing to turn to spiritual formation? Is it a light thing for us to reject July 18th? No, it's all of us. Mm -hmm. They yeah. have returned to provoke me to anger, and lo, they have put the branch to their nose. They have accepted idolatry over true worship. Mm -hmm. Then we have the pronouncement. I mean, in comparison, that, com 
giving the comparison first with Ezekiel 9, verse 9. Then said he unto me, the iniquity of the house of Israel and Judah is exceeding great, and the land is full of blood, and the city full of perverseness. For they say, the Lord hath forsaken the earth, and the Lord seeth not. The application that we made with Ezekiel 9.9, 9, with the men with the slaughtering weapons that begin at the house of God, has been that this message goes first within the church, pretty well knowing that there's going to be very few that are going to accept it. They're going to, they're going to see it, but very few will accept it. But it will be a message that is going to have to be given. Because then here, in the last verse of, of Ezekiel 8, therefore will I also deal in fury. Mine eye shall not spare, neither will I have pity. Though they cry in mine ears with a loud voice, yet I will not hear them. Yeah, and another point, there's 18 verses here. I think the 18 verses represent the 18 years. No disagreement. And it comes to a close of probation. But it's, you know, here, yeah. here's the thing. Do we line this out <clears throat> in Ezekiel just like we did in Judges when well, we were going through that? Well, I looked at it, and I, I don't think we can do it just like each one represents a year from 2001 to 2019. Um, and, and this 18 would be from 2018 to 2019 if we, if we did it as years. Um, because, you know, the 2017 is going to be with the women weeping for Tammuz and so forth. Um, so I don't think we can line it up quite that way. But I do think the 18 years do represent are represented by these 18 verses. Okay. So, you know, because if you did it as years, I mean, you'd have to say 8, eight, eight verse 1 is, you know, from September 11 till uh, 2001 till 2002 and etc. And and I don't see how those all fit in years like we did with the other ones. Um, that's all. But yeah, I, I I did think about that. Well, I was intrigued because the the translators when they were looking at comparative verses here. In Ezekiel 8.18, first of the comparatives, they made use of Ezekiel 5, in Ezekiel 5, in Ezekiel 16, and Ezekiel 24. Mm -hmm. And then the second, again, they started in Ezekiel 5, but then they went through Ezekiel 7 and Ezekiel 9. Mm -hmm. Now, when you come down to this, though they cry in mine ears with a loud voice. Proverbs 1, 28. Then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. Isaiah 1, 15. And when you spread forth your hands, I will hide mine eyes from you. Yea, when ye make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. And then Jeremiah 11, 11. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, behold, I will bring evil upon them, which they shall not be able to escape. Though they, cry, though they shall cry unto me, I will not hearken unto them. <laughs> Is there any more direct application of what is going to happen when the Sunday law has gone into full effect and probation has fully closed? What we're seeing right here. 
Yeah, and, and we had a type of the Sunday law beginning in November of 2019 that continued um, as a symbol in through into 2020. So, so we can see that typically happening in the movement in that connection. And but that's in that 18 years. So that's going to be typical. But we can expect that our history is leading to the actual Sunday law. Okay. You know, but again, I only use these 18 years to, to 2030 as symbols. Um, I'm not, you know, limiting when that Sunday law can occur. Because right now we've been given these symbols and we can look at this chronology symbolically. Um, but we can't predict future events. I just always no. have that to caveat in there. Okay. We are now coming to the close of our time together today. Mm -hmm. Are there any other comments or thoughts? The only comment I have is that, you know, uh, Stephen does, is led by the Holy Spirit to do a little study. He presents it, you know, before our study here, and it becomes very relevant in us understanding what we're looking at. And we see that happening all the time in our morning studies, that things unfold in the world and in our personal studies uh, that help us to understand where we are in, in, in history and to understand the studies themselves. And without the leading of the Holy Spirit in our personal study, um, coming together to study would be almost pointless. Amen. Very much agreed. Okay. Shall we then close with prayer? Gracious Father, we pray now at the close of this meeting that we may carefully consider that which has been discussed. We pray, Father, for your direction through this day. We need you to show us that which you would have us to do and that which we should learn. We thank you for this study. We thank you for this time spent together. We ask now that we may go through our day considering these things that you will direct our steps so that those with whom we come in contact may see your character and not ours. Help us to this end. Direct us, we pray. In Jesus' name, we thank you. Amen. Amen.